Hi, uh, my name is Rasmus Erleman, and uh, this is a trial lecture for the PhD disputation uh, on the 28th of January 2021. Uh, the research was done at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, and the topic today for the trial lecture is change point detection in time series. So first of all, let, uh, let's cover what is a time series. So in simple terms, it's a sequence of data which is indexed by timestamps. And the change point detection for time series uh, can be classified by two different properties. So first, we can divide the methods into, into two classes, uh, online and offline methods. And online methods look at the data sequentially and can detect change points in real time, while offline methods look at just uh, a fixed data set. Uh, another property by which we divide the methods is whether they make parametric assumptions or not. And uh, the methods are called either non-parametric or parametric. Uh, what makes change point detection difficult in time series is understanding the dependency structures. So most of the methods focus on stationary time series because this assumption makes detection mathematically much uh, simpler. We can also assume different dependency models. For example, the simple first order autoregressive model AR1. And uh, later on, we consider a parametric method for this AR1 model. And uh, we also cover a non-parametric meth method, which can detect change points in uh, general ARP time series. In the PhD presentation, we looked at a new non-parametric method for IID datasets. In this lecture, our goal is to briefly mention some simpler models in the beginning and then move on to more complicated methods, which are able to cope with more interesting structures. Uh, for most methods we cover in this lecture, we assume the time series is stationary. Uh, a time series is called stationary if the expected value at each timestamp is independent of time. The second condition says that the covariance function is independent of time for each value h. It means the dependencies between different timestamps is constant in time and doesn't depend on which time moment we observe. Uh, stationary time series can be described by the autocorrelation function. It is defined for lag h as the covariance between the time moment t and t plus h. Lag is called the fixed amount of time that has passed. One specific autoregressive model that we look at is AR1. Uh, we assume the time series is stationary and it satisfies the following equation. At each timestamp, the time series is a constant times the previous time moment, and we add a normally distributed random variable with zero mean. The sequence CT is called white noise. The constant phi is called the autoregressive coefficient, and it is between minus one and one. Also, the random variable CT is not correlated with XS for each S that is uh, smaller than T. In the bottom, we simulated an uh, AR1 process. We fixed the autoregressive coefficient as 0.9, uh, the white noise has variance 1, and the starting value is 0. As phi is quite close to 1, the, the plot looks quite similar to a random walk, because when phi is equal to 1, uh, the process becomes a random walk. So in the previous slide, we looked at a plot of an uh, AR1 uh, time series. So for this uh, slide, we simulated two more, two more data sets. Uh, and the first one has a change point at timestamp 50. The first uh, 50 data points were simulated from an AR1 model with the autocorrelation coefficient being 0 0.9. Then there is a change point, And for the last 50 values, the coefficient decreased to 0 0.3. We can see that as the coefficient decreases, the time series uh, resembles more and more white noise. 
This is because when the coefficient is zero, the process becomes white noise. The next plot displays a non-stationary time series. Uh, it has seasonality, which means it is not stationary. It was generated by replacing phi times the previous time moment by a sine function of time t. If we used uh, some of the traditional change point detection uh, methods here for this particular data set, we would detect multiple change points, but uh, the model that we used to generate it actually stayed the same, so there is no change point. So this shows that the term change point is not uniquely defined, and we need to specify what type of change point we are looking for. Change can happen in, uh, in the model parameters, <clears throat> in the model itself, uh, in the dependency structure, or even in a way that we can't specify mathematically. And later on, we will also look at the method which uses deep learning to detect human-specified change points. Uh, next, we will look at uh, an example for how to detect multiple, uh, multiple change points for AR1 uh, time series. And uh, it is especially computationally intensive if we don't even know the number of change points. In that case, uh, we would have to try numbers from 0 to n minus 1 and all the possible configurations for each integer. This is uh, computationally almost impossible to solve by just trying all the possible solutions. So, for example, later on we will look at an uh, example where we have 173 data points. In that case, we would have to look through 10 to the power of 52 possible solutions. Uh, but it turns out that there is a, a simple solution for a problem like this, where the search space is too large. Uh, and we can use uh, evolutionary algorithms to find the optimal solution, which is going to be the optimal number of change points and the, the, in the right places, so their configuration. For this particular case, uh, we will also cons consider a more complicated dependency structure, the AR1 model. Uh, we use the log normal likelihood with the autoregressive model of the first kind to define the minimum description length, MDL, uh, that we need in the, the specific genetic algorithm that we use in this case to measure fitness. We will construct a log normal model that allows for a reference series and autocorrelation. So let uh, mu1, mu2 to mu m plus one be the location parameters between each change point. The number of change points m is considered unknown. Uh, let's define st as the natural logarithm of xt divided by yt. Then we can model it as a correlated Gaussian series with a simple first order autoregression. And uh, let us also denote phi as the autocorrelation coefficient and sigma square is the variance parameter of, uh, of the white noise. So such a model can, uh, can then be described as follows, as we can see in the middle of the slide. Uh, Zt is the white noise and uh, Rt is, uh, is such a, a function uh, that uh, it gives us the value of which change point segment the index belongs to. So if the first change point occurs at uh, index 10, then RT, where T is less than nine, gives us uh, the value one, which means that we are in the first segment. Uh, the likelihood of this model allowing for the mean to shift is as follows. Uh, we can see that it includes st, st estimate and a variable vt. So st estimate is the best linear prediction of st and the history s1 until the previous st minus 1. Uh, the variable vt is the second moment of the difference between st and the estimate. In other words, uh, it is the, the mean squared prediction error. 
the AR1 dynamics give us ST estimate as the mean in that specific segment plus the autocorrelation coefficient times the previous S minus the mean of the previous segment. And we can see that in the bottom. And this holds for T larger or equal than two. And uh, so we need to know what is the, the first one. So the first estimate is given as simply uh, mu one. The prediction error are, uh, is uh, sigma squared for t greater or equal than 2. And the first one is given by sigma squared divided by 1 minus phi squared. So optimizing the likelihood is a bit more complicated for the autoregressive models, but uh, it's not overly difficult. Uh, it's also done for the general case uh, ARP, uh, and more details can be found uh, at the reference number 7. So first of all, uh, the estimate for the mean is given by the following formula. So this is the mean uh, in the Lth segment. So it means that uh, we are between the change point L minus 1 and L. The variable RL is the, the summation index, and it's the set of all indices uh, in the Lth segment. So if you think about the previous example, so if the first change point is at 10, then R1 is the set that contains all the integers from 1 to 9. So uh, this particular estimator for the mean uh, is asymptotically adjusted for edge effects, uh, but the exact maximum likelihood estimator uh, could have been found, but uh, we would have had to use numerical methods in that case. The estimators for sigma square and the autocorrelation coefficient are given in the in the bottom. So we take the estimators and we insert them into the likelihood L. And uh, this gets us, uh, well, it gives us the optimized likelihood and we denote it with uh, L uh, opt. So this gives us the first component that we need uh, in the minimum description length function. The next component is the, the penalty term. And this depends on the, the number of model parameters. And it can be found as follows, as we can see in the, in the bottom. The optimized likelihood and the penalty term are then combined uh, to give us the MDL, the minimum description length. Uh, we change the base two logarithms to natural logarithms and we ignore all the terms that are constant in N and we get the final form for the MDL. Uh, next, we are going to explain how the evolutionary process uh, uh, works for, for this particular uh, genetic algorithm. So our goal is to determine the optimal model, which means we want to find the optimal number of change points, which is M, and also their configuration, which is tau1, tau2, until tau M. And this is done through minimizing the minimum length, uh, description length, MDL. So each configuration that consists of the number of change points and their positions ex is expressed as a chromosome. And we start the evolutionary process with two, 200 individuals, so 200 uh, chromosomes. And for the first individuals, all the chromosomes, the elements are simulated completely randomly. So this is the initial patch. Uh, next, we let the process run for the first uh, iteration so that uh, it produces the first set of children. And it is done such that we combine fitter chromosomes together uh, so with better MDL score and this gives us a child with M plus J change points and with the same positions as the parents. And we can see that in the, in the middle in there. 
So next, we are going to thin the change points for each child by flipping a coin and either keeping or throwing away each change point. So this, with some extra added variability, uh, gives us the mutation rule for children. Uh, we keep iterating, uh, producing new offspring until the termination, uh, one of the termination conditions is met. The first con termination uh, uh, condition is that uh, a solution is found that satisfies the minimum criteria for MDL. The second condition is that a fixed number of generations is reached and the last condition states that the fitness rating of members is peaking. So in other words, new children uh, don't really produce any extra fitness uh, compared to their parents. So once one of the conditions is met, we can terminate the algorithm and choose the fittest chromosome from our pool of individuals. So uh, let's take uh, a look at uh, a real life example where we have applied this method. We have the annual precipitation data for New Bedford. And by visual observation, uh, perhaps we could say there is a change point at around 1960 and 1895. Uh, we apply the previously defined log normal model with AR1 on this data set. And we found the following segments. Uh, the likelihood method with an evolutionary algorithm was applied on this data set uh, and at first uh, they used method without the AR1 component and it found ch four change points. So the change points were at uh, 1867, 1910, 1965 uh, and 1967. Uh, next they used the AR1 model but uh, it turns out that the autocorrelation coefficient came out to be nearly zero. And this means that there is almost no autocorrelation. They also ran the evolutionary algorithm with uh, different initial values and it converged to the same solution, which is a very good indicator because it means that we most likely did not get stuck in a local minimum spot. Next, we are going to look at uh, a cumulative sum method uh, on Bernoulli random variables and we will test uh, for the parameter increase, so for this very particular change point, change in, par in the parameter. We apply the cumulative sum method on a time series where each random variable xi is Bernoulli with parameter pi and we test uh, if there is a change point uh, uh, where the parameter increases at some timestamp. We monitor the time series for the change sequentially, so this is a, an online method uh, with the cumulative sum test statistic BK. And it is defined as the maximum between zero and the value where we take the previous BK value and we add the, the random variable uh, value, which is either zero or one, uh, and then we subtract the reference value R. The first uh, B0 is chosen to be zero and the parameter R is called the reference value. The test works such that uh, if BK reaches uh, some threshold value which is H at timestamp K then the test uh, signals. So in other words we have found the change point at uh, timestamp K. The reference value R is chosen as half the distance to the so-called out-of-control parameter value. And the control limit H should be about five times the process standard deviation. The, so the performance of this method relies heavily on the choice of R and H and uh, it should be tailored for each uh, case uh, uh, specifically. Uh, so a good example of where this method can be used is, uh, is manufacturing. So let's say we are manufacturing some kind of items and random variables xi, they describe whether the item is defective or not. 
that we manufactured. Uh, the parameters PI, they represent the probabilities of manufacturing a defective item. Uh, we can establish the assumed PI values uh, for when the manufacturing process is working correctly. Uh, and once a piece of machinery breaks uh, in the manufacturing process, the probability of producing a defective unit uh, goes up uh, and the parameter PI increases. So as we observe items at the end of the manufacturing process, uh, the cumulative sum test uh, will signal when we see too many defective units uh, and the test statistic value reaches the control limit. So once that happens, we can stop the manufacturing process and fix the broken piece of machinery. So this is one example of where this particular test can be used in, in real life uh, applications. So let's uh, take a look at uh, an example. We let uh, the test run for 100 iterations and the data was drawn IID from Bernoulli with uh, the parameter being P equal to 0 0.05. We can see that the control limit H was never reached. And this was expected because we did not insert a change point into this data set. Uh, the control limit H and the reference value R were chosen according to the R package Kusum. So in the next slide, uh, we considered another data set. So for this particular data set, we, we inserted uh, a change point. So the first 30 values are IID from Bernoulli with the parameter being P equal to 0 0.05. Then the parameter changed to, to 0 0.2 and another 70 data points were simulated. We can see that the test statistic values are starting to increase after the index uh, 30 and at around the time moment 60 it reached uh, the control limit and this is when the test uh, uh, signaled and the signal is shown on the plot by the yellow star. So we can see that uh, the method took about 30 timestamps to actually detect the change point. So this method has a delay in, in detecting change points and this delay can be taken into consideration when estimating where, when did the change actually happen. So the next method that we are going to cover uses a non-parametric Gaussian kernel to construct the likelihood test and this method is generalized to any dependency structures. So also for ARP, where P is larger than two, um, not like the, the previous likelihood-based uh, test that we looked at. Uh, we start with a d-dimensional time series and the vector yt denotes the values at uh, timestamp t. The time series is split into two consecutive time windows. First, we have the reference time window and then we have the test time window. So let's also denote uh, a capital Y T. Uh, so this is for the first sub subsequence of length K at uh, time T. And the notation T uh, in the sub superscript uh, means that we are transposing either the vector or the matrix. Uh, so the core idea behind this method is that we evaluate the ratio S instead of estimating the reference and the test densities separately. So since non-parametric density estimation is considered to be a difficult problem, uh, we directly estimate the ratio itself. And PTE and PRF are the test and reference uh, densities in this particular formula. So let's take a step back and see how we actually get the likelihood ratio test, uh, the, the test statistic S that we talked about in the previous slide. So let's denote the number i index of each the reference window and the test window. 
that the hypothesis testing framework for, e for the change point detection can be set up as follows. So the null hypothesis is formulated such that the densities for both the reference and the test windows stays the same. So this is H0. And the alternative hypothesis allows the densities to be different. And that's H1. We construct the likelihood ratio test and calculate the value S over the test time window. In the summation superscript, we have the number indices in the test interval. The test statistic S is, uh, is, then, is then monitored sequentially, and when it crosses a chosen threshold, we have found the change point. And this threshold has to, has to be specified uh, depending on what the, what the data is. So all we need is a method to to get, to get the fraction in S. So estimating each density separately is not possible, but as a fraction, it turns out that it can be modeled with uh, non-parametric Gaussian kernels. Uh, the, hyper uh, the, the hyper parameter optimization uh, is done a bit differently, whether the method is used uh, online or offline. And in the online case, uh, uh, we used uh, the stochastic gradient descent uh, and the uh, new solutions are built on top of the old ones uh, recursively. So the whole online method is described by the following plot. So once we are given a new value in the time series, uh, uh, the reference and the test time windows are shifted forward by one unit. The hyperparameters in the Gaussian kernel are, are recursively updated and the density ratio is used to calculate the test statistic value S. And after each time step, we check if the, the value S is above the threshold or not that we previously specified. And if it crosses the threshold, we can reject the null hypothesis and say the test window density changes sufficiently enough, or in other words, it just means that there is a change point in the test window. Uh, we applied this method on an uh, AR4 dataset, and at the time moment 1000, uh, there is a change point. And everything else stayed the same, but uh, the third uh, autocorrelation coefficient uh, uh, changed from 0 0.5 to 0 0.7. So it's a, it's a very slight change in the model. Uh, the first plot uh, displays the data itself. Uh, and we can see that uh, visually it's quite difficult to see the change point or, or point out its location. But uh, the black line uh, points out where the change happened. The second plot uh, in the bottom displays the test statistic S uh, values. Uh, and we can see that it stays below 0 0.1 when there is no change point. Uh, and once the change point at time moment 1000 enters the, the test time window, the value of S starts growing. And after about 50 time moments, uh, the value has crossed uh, the threshold, at, which is uh, 0 0.2. And uh, this is when the test uh, signaled. So as we can see, uh, this method works with a slight delay, uh, li like we, we saw in this example. So it took about 50 time steps uh, for the method to actually detect the change point. Uh, in practice, uh, uh, the change point estimate can be adjusted by the expected delay. Next, uh, we will look at a deep learning method <clears throat> for uh, for change point detection. Uh, so for this uh, method, the data has annotations added to it. And these annotations, they indicate changes in state. Uh, we will call these human-specified annotations uh, breakpoints. Uh, and this algorithm can also be generalized to the regular case, uh, to the regular change points that we covered previously. So it's not only limited to these uh, human-specified change points, 
which are called breakpoints. Uh, the motivation for developing uh, breakpoint detection methods uh, came from IoT, uh, which means Internet of Things, uh, datasets. So often the recent datasets, they include annotations by a human expert specifying states. Uh, these datasets can be used to build automatic uh, labeling algorithms that can produce labels just as an expert would, would do. Uh, traditional change point detection methods only look for changes in the statistical parameters or models. Uh, the following method can detect more subtle changes that uh, cannot be detected with just uh, the traditional methods. Uh, it learns the features that are most useful to represent the input data and thus can discover a hidden structure, not just the mean uh, not just in the mean or, or in the, the variance of the data. <clears throat> the al algorithm is explained in more detail in the reference number 8. Uh, and it uses autoencoders to automatically extract unique features uh, specific to our uh, input dataset uh, without making any prior assumptions about uh, the underlying generative process which uh, produced the data. So these features are then used to, to segment the time series into segments between the breakpoints. So we start with, uh, with a multivariate time series. So it has NC uh, variables and uh, T timestamps. And this time series is divided into overlapping time windows, S1, S2, and so on. Uh, these time windows are then mapped to the hidden layer with, a, with the encoder E, which uses a nonlinear activation function. Uh, and this nonlinear activation function is typically uh, a sigmoid or a hyperbolic tangent function. We input the data with parameters W and B, uh, where W is a matrix and B is a bias vector. And the output that we get uh, is called a feature. So once we have the features, we can use the decoder to map the, the feature back into the data domain. So like, like before, we use a nonlinear activation function for it. Uh, and usually in most cases, uh, uh, it's the same one that we used in encoding. Parameter W prime is usually the transpose version of W, and BD is uh, is a is a bias vector, just like before. The parameters W, W prime, B, and BD uh, are found through minimizing the error of the reconstructed sample. Uh, we apply the encoder to the time frame S, and then we decode the features back to S. Uh, and this search space is explored with the stochastic gradient descent algorithm to find the optimal solution. So although this it is effective, it relies heavily on the seed, on the initial seed uh, that we used in the optimization process. So to prevent this dependency, uh, the solution is to use multiple hidden layers. So it works such that uh, we stack models on top of each other uh, and this mitigates the effect uh, of uh, our initial choice. And the optimal solution that we learned by the first layer is, uh, is, first, is then used as an input in the second layer and so on. So this is how the stacking process works. And for our example, uh, for the real life data set, we used uh, two hidden layers, uh, and this turned out to be the optimal number of hidden layers for that particular data set. Uh, the function that we are minimizing consists of a, a loss function, as we can see in the bottom. Uh, the typical choice uh, here uh, is either the cross entropy loss uh, or the squared loss. Uh, uh, the second term with the lambda is called uh, a regularization term, or also it can, it's also called uh, the weight decay term. Its purpose is to prevent overfitting. 
So the breakpoints are found through analyzing how the features uh, evolve uh, through different time windows. And when the distance between different timestamps uh, changes, we can conclude that a change happened. So the distance uh, between consecutive features is calculated as, as follows. We can see that it is simply the Euclidean distance between the features, the consecutive features, and uh, there's also a normalizing constant. If the distance between features uh, changes in time, uh, it means that there is some kind of change in the data and we can conclude that there is a change point or a breakpoint in this case. Uh, to find all the change points, we plot the sequence of uh, distances and uh, we use each local maximum to estimate the breakpoint. Uh, the optimal window size varies depending on the input data. Um, the size of the feature space also plays an important role. Uh, so for our real life data set, uh, uh, the feature space was chosen to be 10 times smaller uh, than the input data space, for example. So let's take a look at the, the real life uh, data set. So on the upper plot, uh, we can see the raw data itself. And at around the timestamp 2.5, there is a, a large jump. And at around 3, uh, we can see that it drops down again. Uh, the ground truth uh, describes where the actual breakpoint uh, occurred. So this is the benchmark the benchmark for, for testing. Uh, let's take a look at the lower plot uh, and uh, we can see how well the deep learning algorithm performed. So on the y-axis we have the distances uh, for features as they uh, evolve over time uh, and we can see that the distance uh, jumps up and comes back down again right when the, the breakpoint happens where we can see the ground truth change points. So it shows that the method is correctly detecting breakpoints in this particular data set. So uh, to summarize what we talked about, uh, in the beginning we talked about uh, some of the fundamental properties of time series like uh, stationarity, autocorrelation, seasonality, independence, uh, dependence structures, and so on. Uh, and these concepts were illustrated with uh, examples and uh, explained how they affect uh, change point detection. The first method that we covered was parametric and it was likelihood based. Uh, evolutionary process was used to tackle the computational intense uh, search space. Uh, the minimum description length uh, use the likelihood to measure individual fitness in the evolutionary algorithm. Uh, a specifically tailored genetic uh, algorithm was then used to find the, the optimal number of change points. So this is the, the evolutionary algorithm that we were talking about. And it, it was uh, then used to find the optimal number of change points and also their configuration. So the position of the change points. And this method was also uh, considered on the simplest autoregressive model, which is AR1. Uh, the next method that we covered was based on analyzing the cumulative sums. Uh, we assumed a Bernoulli underlying model and tested for increase in the parameter P. Uh, so this method is simpler than the other ones we covered but uh, it can be useful in certain practical applications uh, like ma monitoring uh, a manufacturing process. Next, uh, we looked at a non-parametric online method which used non-parametric Gaussian kernels to estimate the density ratio between a reference time window and a test time window. So this method was particularly versatile as it doesn't have model assumptions like the other likelihood based method had. We also looked at uh, an example where this method was applied on an 
AR4 dataset and the change happened in the third autocorrelation coefficient. Uh, it was able to successfully detect the change point and uh, it did it with about 50 time steps delay. Uh, the last method that we covered looked at the more general method uh, and it was based on uh, deep learning. So instead of just detecting statistically specified change points, uh, it was able to detect human specified change points or so-called breakpoints. And uh, each method that we covered, uh, we also included uh, a real-life example of how it can be used in practice. Uh, this was my trial lecture for the BHD disputation, and I would like to thank you for listening. <laughs>